Hi, I'm Todd Ellis with Secure Networkers. I'm here today to talk to you about email security and DMARC. So today I wanted to talk to you about DMARC and how it relates to email and what all that exactly means. Uh, you may hear about phishing attacks and our email got hacked, but the reality of that is, is there's many different ways that a bad actor can get a hold of your accounts. But one of the things you can do to implement a security layer is, is to implement DMARC. So DMARC stands for Domain Based Message Authentication Reporting and Conformance. Eh, that sounds like a bunch of junk, but the reality is, is that if you want DMARC, you have to go back a little further. So let's talk about DNS. All these things are basically performed within the DNS. So you'll go into your registrar typically or whoever your NS records are hosted with publicly. This is just talking about website stuff, uh, any kind of A record that you may have that points to the website or some other resource that you have. An A record basically is uh, a record that points some type of a subdomain or your, your root domain to an IP address. Uh, C names is basically points a name of a subdomain or a root domain to an actual name somewhere. So if you wanted to translate uh, remote.abccompany.com and you actually wanted the website, go, website to go somewhere else or the other resource to go somewhere else, you would use a C name to point to another name. But if you want to use an IP address, that's an A record. So now let's get back to email. So with email and DNS, you want your MX record. Now the MX record stands for mail exchanger. And so your mail exchanger is kind of like thinking about in the world of email, it's the way the water flows, right? It's the way the river's flowing. So if I want to change my email over from Zoho over to Office 365, the, one of the steps that I'm going to take is once I've authenticated that I am who I am, I'm going to change my MX record. Now, I can migrate email during that time from my Zoho account over to 365 or 365 over to Zoho. But in, once I move that MX record, now I'm moving which way the water flows, the email flows to all of my, my resources. In other words, if it's Todd at abccompany.com, my email is going to flow now from Zoho over to Office 365 or to a local exchanger, wherever you point it. It's going to flow to that mail exchanger. An MX record is typically identified in priorities as well. You'll see like a zero or a number 10 or number 20. In the world of MX, the lower the number, the higher the priority. So you're going to use a zero before you use a 10 and you're going to use a 10 before you use a 20. So you kind of get the picture of how that works. So once you set that up, now let's get into things that we were talking about. So when you go into your domain management, typically you won't see something that says SPF. Some providers provide it, but some don't. Typically you're going to do this where it says TXT. You're actually going to create the SPF record along there. And what SPF does is, um, Get along some jargon here. So SPF stands for Sender Policy Framework. It was developed in the early 2000s and basically it just says, hey, this is an authorized system to send my email. If you have an SPF record, that's what it's doing. It's a good first fresh start for security as far as where you want your email uh, to say it's coming from. If you have an SPF, some mail providers actually say, hey, if the SPF record um, is, is good to go, uh, then bring the mail in. But if it doesn't line up, it's coming from another resources, you can block the message. It depends on if you have like a Barracuda uh, email uh, filtering device or some other type of email filtering device, uh, Proofpoint, Mimecast, they'll kind of honor those types of, uh, those kind of discrepancies. They'll look at the SPF. So once you set up this, t this text record, right, and you can have multiple resources as well. You can say, hey, I want uh, email to be able to relay from Office 365, but you may also have a local on-prem exchange server that you want it to, uh, to come from as well. So then you can put the, the name or the IP that that comes from. So 
the, the other limitation of SPF is you can only do 10 domains as identifying resources or where your email comes from. So if you got more than 10 places that your email is being able to relay from, it's not going to go more than 10. It'll only honor 10 on the SPF record. The next phase of that is DKIM. Okay? So DKIM stands for Domain Keys and Identified Mail. Uh, basically, this was developed back in, I think, 2004. Yahoo uh, developed the Yahoo Mail system, developed the Domain Keys portion, and Cisco developed the, uh, I believe it was called Identified Internet Mail. And so what they did is they combined these two policies together, and that's where they came up with DKIM. And so what DKIMite does is it just a, very similar to SPF, it basically allows the person receiving the message to check, hey, did this mail really come from that source, a legitimate source of that domain sender? So ABC company is trying to send to XYZcompany.com and XYZ company can go back and say, hey, is ABC's email server really this server? And if it's not, then it gives it another chance to reject it. Uh, again, these, I keep using the terminology reject it, right? This is something that's now being built into email servers all over the world. If you got an old SendMail server that you developed back in the 2000s on some Slackware box, probably doesn't have these policies. But most all modern day email exchangers are honoring these types of policies. Now, let's come back to where we started from, DMARC. If you don't have an SPF record and you don't have a DKIM record, DMARC will not work at all. Has to have good policies and, and good sound credentials in SPF records and DKIM records in order for DMARC to work. And again, going back to what I said before and I kind of skipped over that, DKIM and DMARC are also entered in as a text field in your DNS record. And you would do that on your NS server that your, your authorized server that your, your domain name's DNS is identified from. It doesn't always have to be a registrar, but typically it is. There's a couple few exceptions, but the reality is that's what it's done. So now talk, why in the world do I need to do all this stuff? Sounds kind of complicated. It's actually pretty simple as long as those are actual relay sources that you have. Now, where do people get into trouble? They typically will go out, they'll create an SPF record, they'll create a DKIM record, they'll create a DMARC record, but oh, guess what? Now my, my contact form on my website no longer works. Oh no, what do you do, right? Well, guess what? You didn't identify it as an actual relay source, and probably you shouldn't. It's best to use a, an outside source like SendGrid, uh, there's other services that are out there too that you want to relay your messages off your website. Don't put your credentials and, and relay your mail directly inside your own internal domain. It's just not a good policy and it's a good way to get accounts compromised and, and also you'll have this, this relay that's out there. And the other thing too, you probably just won't get a lot of these messages. A lot of them will be sent to spam because or they'll just go right to somebody's delete box or get rejected because it doesn't look like it's from a legitimate source. Because in most cases, people's website, it isn't hosted by the same place that where you have your email. Um, I mean, that, that used to be a common thing, but it's just not anymore. So those are things that you will see more often. So again, why am I doing all this? Number one, eliminate some phishing attempts. Once you have these things in place, people will not be able to spoof you any longer. Now, are there exceptions to that? Absolutely. I see this all the time. I see, I've seen one this morning where basically you, the, the actor basically sends an email out to someone's email address saying, hey, this is Microsoft or this is Google or this is Gmail, uh, this is Zoho, and we need you to change your password. We think something's going on. We need you to immediately change your password. The individual clicks the link. They don't look and see that it's actually a phishing attempt. It prompts them for credentials. They type in their email address and their password. Boom, now their account's been had. And now that individual is basically sending out messages as that individual. The other thing they'll do is they'll create forwarders in there so they get copies of all the email that's coming in. Now they're creating some man in the middle opportunities and now the person is basically allowed them to say, hey, uh, accounting departments are notoriously uh, big targets because they say, hey, I need you to wire the money uh, this month for this 
from our normal payment into this new uh, account. Uh, unfortunately, there's some banks out there that will not cooperate very well when it comes to money transfers. So uh, beware out there. This is information that you need to take heed from. Uh, these are things that are out there that are actively happening. 70% uh, of the global email sent is some type of a phishing attack or some type of malicious email. Uh, man, that makes you feel good, right? A lot of this stuff ends up in the garbage. If your company has good policies in place, you're probably not seeing a lot of this stuff. But all it takes is someone going out there, getting in the middle. It may not even be with inside your organization. It may be a vendor organization. It may be a client organization. And now they've seen your messages. They're going to recreate some similar domain. They'll register it pretty quick on some cheap domain site. They'll set up a cheap email box and then they'll relay messages in between making themselves look like somebody in your department. Maybe they took the letter W and, and, and re registered it now with two V's if you have that in your domain name. Uh, transpose an I and an E. You know, people's eyes just kind of read what they're expecting to see. Unless you're looking for it, you're not going to see it. So those are things that you should concentrate. Again, this was about DMARC. And I kind of led into going through it really fast on what DMARC does. And I told you that if you don't, if you want DMARC, then you got to have SPF and you also have to have DCAM. And obviously, if we're getting into DNS, you got to have an MX record, mail exchanger. Something else to consider too, uh, since we're on this topic, it's a little off topic. If you're going to set up any type of uh, smart device, like you want your email on your company phones and stuff like that, always set up an auto discover record just makes it so much easier, uh, points everyone in the right direction. Sometimes you'll get slow email responses even after you set it, if you, even after you set up it up on Outlook, but you want to be able to relay on the phone, make sure you set up an auto discover record. Uh, it's getting bad out there, guys. Cybersecurity is a big part of it, but email is big time because most people don't institute these things. There are services out there that are a little bit more advanced. Agari makes a great product, but unless you're actually, uh, I think it's an organization of 10,000 users or more, I don't know if you can set up an Agari account. So unless you got 10,000 users, Agari is kind of out. But I do happen to know that Cisco sell, resells an Agari uh, license. So you get the same experience as the big guys, but uh, you can do it directly with Cisco. In conjunction with their acquisition of Ironport to so their, their secure email option, it's a great way to go. Uh, many other great ones out there. Demarkly a, does a good job with setting up DMARCs. But again, these are all paid services. Uh, you're looking somewhere between 18 to like 150 bucks per month to kind of set up one of these services like Demarkly. The other ones are more uh, heavy hitter. They're trying to do spam and they're doing a lot of training. Uh, training is a great thing as well. Uh, know before is a great resource to train your uh, your office staff to say hey you know uh, these are these are not real phishing emails but they come to the individual and it, so they click on it and they go oh you guess what you just got the computer stuff uh, for the entire resource for the company hacked because you clicked on this email and then that's not really the case but it's used as training highly effective people give out gift cards if they successfully turn in these bad Emails, know before is a great resource. I know we covered a lot of topics there, but I uh, hope you guys are doing well. Again, Todd Ellis, Secure Networkers, CTO. Got any questions, hit us up at contact at securenetworkers.com or service at securenetworkers.com if you have a problem. Thanks so much. Have a great day.